as the economy was changing during the Industrial Revolution, you have workers flooding to these urban areas, and the opportunities that were brought in by the Industrial Revolution was a major reason for this. Um, suddenly now you have these giant factories opening up, you have tremendous opportunities in the oil industry, the steel industry, and workers are going into the city looking for these jobs in cities such as New York and Pittsburgh and Chicago. But with that comes some benefits and some, some negative consequences. Um, so the big question for today's lecture is how did the Industrial Revolution impact workers? And one of the most obvious ways is you have an increase in wages. In fact, workers' wages actually do go up during the Industrial Revolution. People are making money. That's one of the reasons why you have millions of people coming into the United States, um, many coming from Europe, immigrants coming in from all over the world, um, many people leaving their, their rural areas, the agricultural areas, looking for this kind of opportunity uh, to make more money. With that, though, comes problems. Even though you have this opportunity that's presented by the Industrial Revolution, many people still had trouble supporting a family. In fact, it was very common, especially amongst lower and in, lower income people, where everybody in the house worked, including children. Um, child labor became a really common, um, and there's a lot of reasons why children are going to be uh, attractive to employers. You can exploit them more efficiently. They're less likely to cause problems. You can pay them less. So child labor becomes extremely common during the Industrial Revolution. Um, and wages were so low, and not only were the wages low, but the conditions are horrible. It was extremely common for there to be no laws with regard to worker safety. It was um, not unheard of that people would work six, sometimes even seven days a week, hours, 12 hours being um, a common amount that would be worked, um, no sick pay, no vacation time, no unemployment insurance if you were to lose your job, if you were injured on the job, you could take a look at these two individuals, both of them without their arms, both of them injured while working in a factory, you were without any kind of compensation. Those kind of things that we think about today, the safety net that helps people if they get hurt or if they lose their job, didn't exist during this time. The conditions were hazardous, and a big reason for that was the fact that laissez-faire, no regulation. That's bullshit. And with that comes little protections for workers. Um, there's a figure in the book that basically says in 1882, an average of 675 workers were killed in work accidents every week. 675 a week. And so this creates tremendous burdens on individuals um, within the workplace. And many people began to question the wealth that was being generated. Here you got this very famous political cartoon where these wealthy industrialists are sitting upon these bags of money. You got people like Vanderbilt and other industrialists. And meanwhile, while they are reaping the benefits of the wealth, the workers are the ones who are shouldering the burdens, the hard times, the difficult and low wages. They're building this wealth, but yet they're not being compensated appropriately for it. And so what workers begin to do, more so than in previous times, is begin to organize. And a big part of this period of time is this change in the way work is taking place. Work goes through a huge transformation during the Industrial Revolution, and work becomes very specialized, the specialization of labor meaning workers no longer worked on a product from start to finish. There was this new relationship between employer and employee. And some of the ways that work changed was work became mechanized, very uh, 
common to see machines in the production process. Um, and with that comes low skilled workers. One of the things that's going to occur is you're going to see workers who don't need as many skills as they once did. Now that doesn't mean the job's easy. It's very difficult work. And you don't need a lot of skills because basically you're doing one aspect of production. So in this particular photo, you have workers who are working on the production of a washing machine. And the electrical belt will go, it's mechanized, and meanwhile the workers will be each doing one component, one phase of the production. So you don't need a lot of skills. You just need to know how to do your part really well and quickly. And because you don't need a lot of skills, and because it's very specialized, you could pay low wages. And workers were getting tremendously low wages during this time period, and they're easily replaced. So if a worker gives you trouble, you can get rid of them and replace them with someone else. There's a pool of workers available to take the place of those workers that may be too slow, demand higher wages or things like that. And one of the big parts of this is very strict factory discipline. If for some reason one of these workers is late, is ill, is not working fast enough, it is in the employer's interest to speed up production, maximize profits, so you get rid of those workers who you feel are being inefficient. Now with this, you know, rapid pace becomes very dangerous working conditions. Extremely dangerous. Think of that number. 675 people are killed each week. This is, this is, this is just the norm. And so work is changing. Everything is about very much this, this idea of, you know, efficiency. If you take a moment, press pause on the lecture, read through this brochure that was given to workers uh, to instill values. What are, what, what are those values? Speed, you know, following directions, this type of thing. Read through it and you can get a sense of what was expected of workers. Now, the change in the workplace really kind of comes with the assembly line. The assembly line is the kind of symbol of the Industrial Revolution. It's efficient, it's fast, it makes things very quickly, mass production, all of these things that we kind of value in business and the guy who really is the one who shows how it's done is a guy that his name is pretty common this is how we do we make a move and act the fool while we up in the club this is how we do this is how we do henry ford was very very kind of efficient in his use of the assembly line in the automobile industry in fact, it's going to be Henry Ford using the, the, the assembly line in his factories that's going to allow for mass productions of cheap automobiles that the average American family could afford later on into the 1920s. So work is changing. The lives of workers are changing. There's opportunity, but it's coming at a cost. And so these workers who are kind of being the, 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 the core of what, what is building this industrial revolution are looking for ways to improve their working situation. They need to find some sort of, of, of way to equalize the power dynamic between boss and employee. And that comes in the mass formation of what we call unions. And unions are basically organizations of workers. Um, they can be national. They could be at a, a particular company. They, they basically are a group of workers whose goal is to advocate on the behalf of the entire group. And what we call it when workers negotiate with the employer together, it's called collective bargaining. And that's basically the essence of what the union was all about, collective bargaining. So rather than this guy with the really awesome mustache going to his boss and saying, hey, the working conditions are not up to the standards that I feel are necessary, or we should get sick time, or hey, my arm blew off, you know, I need some sort of compensation, the group would work together. The entire group of workers would come together and they'd form a union. 
the Union of Hard Hat Handsome Men or the United Steelworkers Union. I always love this picture right here. This guy is so awesome. He's got the buff forearm, the awesome sledgehammer, the killer beard with the killer stash, the, the epic hat, the stare that looks, I will kill you. So these are the workers, and they're looking for an opportunity to make a difference in their daily lives. Wages, hours, those types of things. And it kind of is a simple concept, right? The employer is the one with the power. He's the big fish in the pond. He's able to, to exercise full control over the workers. But if the workers find a way to unite, they can somehow equalize things. They can figure out a way to, to give the workers the power, the voice that they need. So these unions start forming. And what's important to keep in mind um, is management, the boss, the employer, has certain tools or certain things that they could do to exercise their strength or their power. And workers, labor, the unions have certain tools that they can use to try to get their way. So, for example, for, for, for workers, for union members, they could do things like, Because it's Friday, you ain't got no job. Boycotts. If you work for a particular company and you feel that company is not following your wishes or your, your, your demands, you can try to organize a boycott. For instance, Cesar Chavez during the 1960s organized a boy, boycott against the grape industry. Not just amongst grape workers, but against the public. Getting people on your side that way. Workers also have other tools. You need to borrow a job with your broke ass. Informational picketing. Letting the public know what's going on, passing out flyers to the public, you know, staging protests to tell people what's going on, what are the conditions like, what are the demands that you're asking for, trying to get public opinion on your side. Go out and look for a job. The word today is job. J-O-B. Closed shop is another strategy or, or tool of labor. Closed shop is basically requiring that all workers at a particular place belong to the union. Um, and that way, you ensure that everybody within a particular organization or company or factory belongs to a union. So that's a goal that workers strive towards. Because it's Friday, you ain't got no job. And the most obvious and the most commonly kind of known tactic of workers is the strike, refusing to work walking out on the job and trying to shut down production or whatever the job happens to be to force management to come to the table and bargain with the workers. So these are different strategies that labor has. Now management has a lot of power too, especially during the Industrial Revolution. For example, power, especially during this Industrial Revolution, management has. For example, if you were out on strike, what one of the tactics of the management would be to hire scabs, replacement workers. And they get that name scab because back in the day, someone who took the job of a worker who was on strike was very often the target of a lot of anger and sometimes a little beat down. And the scab, you know, beating them up and giving them those scabs to show that they are not a part of the union's cause. So scabs are replacement workers. Pinkerton Guards was basically a private detective police force that corporations such as Carnegie Steel used. And those guards would spy on workers. They would use violence to try to break up protest. And so Pinkerton Guards were used back during the Industrial Revolution. Blacklisting. Basically, workers that are causing trouble or, or trying to form unions, in many cases, would be blacklisted. And basically, that meant your name would be circulated amongst a particular industry, for example, steel, and you would not be able to find employment anywhere. You would not be hired. Other examples of power. Court injunctions, getting the court to rule against the labor union, forcing the workers back into the factory. So getting the law to declare a strike illegal, for example. Open shop is the opposite of closed shop. It basically is creating a company in which no unions are allowed. And many 
employers during the Industrial Revolution try to keep unions out. And then finally, fear. Getting public opinion to portray the union as being radical. That they are violent. That they are communist or anarchist or socialist or that they're going to destroy property or that they are using whatever tactic but getting the people to feel that the union is not the one who should be supported. So all of these things are done during the Industrial Revolution to try to gain an upper hand between workers and management. Now, strikes, there's one right now, 2012, September, teachers in Chicago are going on strike. The issues are tremendously complex, um, but it's a perfect example of a union, the Chicago Teachers Union, using their influence, the power of the strike, to bring attention to the cause that they are trying to uh, address, which is their contract negotiations with the city of Chicago. Um, and once again, these are issues that, you know, get very complicated, but pay attention to what's going on in Chicago. Now, what ends up happening is you actually get a series of unions. There's so many different ones. I'm just going to highlight two, two of the big important ones. The first one that you should know about is the American Federation of Labor, the AFL. And it's created in 1886, and the American Federation of Labor um, is an interesting union. Uh, and it was founded by a guy named Samuel Gompers. Kick it! And Samuel Gompers, not only did he have an awesome stash, an awesome mustache, extra credit if you grow a mustache that looks as cool as that, come to school for a week, five points. Samuel Gompers, his union, the American Federation of Labor, focused on issues that were very practical, what they called bread and butter issues. And basically what that meant was they were not going to organize all workers. They were going to organize, go out and look for a job. The word today is job, J-O-B. Skilled workers. And this is known as craft unionism. The American Federation of Labor focused on particular crafts, particular professions, and they focused on the skilled workers. And the reason behind that is real simple. The skilled workers are much more difficult to get rid of. They tend to be a little bit more educated. They tend to be... Uh, easier to organize for a variety of reasons. And the American Federation of Labor focused on those workers and go out and look for a job. The word today is job. J-O-B. There is no attempt to or uh, organize the unskilled. For the American Federation of Labor, the unskilled workers were difficult because they could be replaced very easily. And that's one of the problems the labor union movement had at this time is they were divided. It wasn't as simple of, we are the workers, we stand together, solidarity forever. It wasn't as simple as that. And so the American Federation of Labor focused on, because it's Friday, you ain't got no job. Bread and butter issues. That term bread and butter, they're practical things that workers can use. An eight hour workday, wages, higher wages, shorter work week. They're not interested in social reforms like child labor or equal pay for men and women. Um, they ignore racial issues. They're much more kind of a bread and butter, craft union, skilled workers union. And they're headed by Samuel Gompers. They're going to participate in a bunch of strikes during this time. But that's one example of a union forming during this period. Another one was much more radical. This other more radical labor union took the goals of the American Federation of Labor and upped them a bit. And this one was the Knights of Labor. They were interested in wages and things like that, but they're also issued in fighting the power. And the Knights of Labor um, had different goals. Yeah, they want, you know, shorter work week. They want wages higher. They want these types of things. But they also called for things such as equal pay for women. You know, women were paid less even when doing the same profession as men. 
many jobs were not open to women back then. And as a result of their kind of calling uh, for reforms on that area, women joined their group as well. They called for an end to child labor. They wanted cooperative ownership of factories, meaning workers should share in the ownership of the factories in which they work. Um, another thing the Knights of Labor did was they wanted African Americans to be allowed to join, except in the South. South was filled with Jim Crow, racism, segregation, but in the North, they advocated that black and white workers should be able to join the same organization. Race is another thing that divided the labor union movement and made it ineffective. Workers were, you know, hostile to different groups of people. One of the interesting members of the Knights of Labor is the woman you see on the screen, Mother Jones. Uh, she, she got the nickname uh, Mother Jones, her real name is Mary Harris Jones, and she's going to be a member of the labor movement. She's going to be an advocate against child labor, and we'll learn more about her in another unit. So you have all these different labor unions, and there's other ones you could read about in your book, the Industrial Workers of the World, headed by William Haywood, nicknamed Big Bill. There's a lot of different unions, so read about them in your book. But you also have strikes taking place. In fact, between the period 1870 and 1900, every area in pink on this map experienced strikes taking place. Some of them, with the Red Stars, are areas that had major labor disputes, huge strikes. The first one takes place in 1877. And what was going on in the 1870s is there was a depression in the country in 1873. Wages were cut, businesses were closing, and workers on various railroads uh, in Baltimore and Ohio are seeing their wages drop. And what they basically begin to do is in 1877, they decide that the wages continue to drop and they start to organize. They start to organize and they start to make decisions that perhaps a strike needed to occur. In fact, over 50,000 miles of railroad track comes to a halt when they decide to stop working. The president at the time, Rutherford B. Hayes, decides to intervene. And the interesting thing about his intervention is it's not on behalf of the strikers, the railroad workers. He decides to interfere and intervene, rather, by sending in the troops. Violence erupts. Buildings are destroyed. The federal troops are sent in. It's, it's a mess. In some instances, the workers were to blame. Some of the workers tended to... Uh, kind of go beyond just striking and, and, and violence and burning and looting of buildings. But in, for the most part, it's the presence of these troops. Rutherford, who is by far, in my opinion, one of the ugliest presidents, his name is Rutherford. His mother had him as a child and said, I am going to name this little sweet baby Rutherford. He... There he is. Rutherford. Maybe he would be handsome without the beard. Rutherford does things besides sending out the federal troops. But yellow dog contracts are forced on the workers. Yellow dog contract was basically a agreement by a worker, usually uh, because of force, that said you would not join a union that you pledge that you will not join a union, and that was something that many workers were forced to sign after this, this event. Um, also, the Pinkerton Guards, those private police force that I mentioned before, they were sent in, and the strike was broken. And what you see happening is, and here's a, a sketch of some of the railroad uh, cars and some of the depots actually aflame. So violence is taking place, and it creates a difficult situation because many people in the public blame the workers. Look at these radicals. Look at these agitators. But there's other problems. The workers had problems internally. For example, 
Houston, we have a problem. There's a lot of challenges facing the labor movement. There was ethnic and racial divisions. Many unions didn't want immigrants to join their union. Many of them were anti-immigrant. They felt that immigrants came in and took low wages, which reduced the amount of jobs that were available to American workers. There was racial divisions. Many unions felt that African-American workers worked for less and were paid less, so therefore were a threat to their wages or their job security. There was divisions between skilled and unskilled workers. You know, the American Federation of Labor didn't really focus on unskilled workers because there's this fear that these unskilled workers are easily replaced, therefore would be more difficult to organize. And the biggest challenge by far is the fact that corporations had tremendous resources, tremendous power, and the government had no protections in place for workers. The unions were basically on their own. There was a laissez-faire attitude, there was no protection, there was no right to join a union, and very often they were broken up. So you got a lot of challenges facing workers. Um, in fact, though, one of the things that kind of occurs, and this is not all workers, but in parts of the West where the Chinese population, the Chinese immigrant population was really high, you have anti-Chinese riots, and sometimes it was workers that were a part of these. There was a tension there that the Chinese were coming in and the Chinese were stealing jobs. Classic political cartoon, you got the, the, the white American man outside, unemployed, nothing to do, and what's happening over here? This Chinese worker is doing a million different jobs. He's stealing the jobs from the Americans and therefore it was labor unions in some cases, not all, but labor unions in some cases that supported in 1882 the Chinese Exclusion Act. Chinese Exclusion Act basically did exactly what it said. It kept out Chinese immigrants from coming into the United States. There was some exceptions. If you were a student, if you were highly educated or something, you can get in still, but it was even then very difficult. And you could see the Democratic Party right here, no more Chinese. It's a, it's a big victory for, for this particular group. Um, and so labor unions, in some cases, were supporters of this act, which was keeping out a particular group of people. And it was based upon this idea of fear, that somehow this group was stealing jobs, this group was changing America for the worse. So you have all this stuff happening, a couple more strikes, and then we're going to be done. Haymarket is another one of these examples of a bad situation turning even worse. Haymarket, uh, what occurred is some police officers, and very often the police acted very violently towards the workers, um, ended up killing a group of uh, people on strike. And these workers were killed um, at a uh, plant. Um, a couple of them had been killed and a couple more wounded at a plant called McCormick Harvester the day before. And what ends up happening is the workers are outraged at this violence towards one of their own. And you have this poster which shows the mass meeting that is called. And it's both in English and German, which shows you the immigrants who are working as well as the English-speaking uh, workers. And they call this massive protest to take place in Chicago in Haymarket Square. And a mass group of workers show up to protest. 3,000 strong. And when the protest ends on May 4th, 1886, what you have happening is someone tosses a bomb into the crowd. The bomb leads to the police to start shooting. And following the police shooting and the bomb going off, you have seven police officers killed. You have many workers who are also killed. To this day, we don't know 100% sure who threw the bomb, but after the Haymarket riot, as it was called, many people in the public blame the workers. Um, a group of people are convicted for the deaths of the police officer, a group of workers, um, some of them with radical associations. Um, Four of them are hung, one commits suicide in prison, and what happens is they're known as the Haymarket Martyrs because many people in the labor movement say 
they didn't do it. They were unjustly put on trial and, and, and eventually killed. Um, but what happens is many people in the public turn anti-union. Look at the union, the radicals. Now what you need to keep in mind is very often the unions, the workers were scapegoated. They were, it's easy to say the workers are to blame. And very often the violence in some cases was the result of workers kind of doing certain things, but very often they're reacting to these Pinkerton guards, these police officers, the government troops, the National Guard being sent out. So it's a lot more complicated than the good guys versus the bad guys. Another strike, the third one that you should know about, takes place at Homestead, 1892 near Pittsburgh. And Homestead... <laughs> Homestead, Pennsylvania is a steel factory which was owned by none other than your boy, Andrew Carnegie. And the workers at Homestead were working in atrocious, horrible conditions. Really poor conditions. And Andrew Carnegie's right-hand man, the company president, Henry Clay Frick, decides in 1892 he's cutting wages. And what he ends up doing is the workers decide, okay, you're going to cut wages. They go on strike. And what happens next? Troops are sent out. National Guard is called. In total, nine workers are killed during the violence. And eventually, the union is busted, the plant returns into operation, and it's another defeat for workers. The last major strike takes place at an area named Pullman, near Chicago. And this one takes place at a company known as the Pullman Palace Car Company. And basically, this was one of those railroad car companies. They specialized in making luxury railroad cars. So kind of these type cars where you can ride in style across the country or from city to city. And the Pullman Palace Car Company was one of these places that um, experienced some problems. There was a depression. Workers' wages were cut. A bunch of workers were laid off. But what was unique about Pullman is it was a company town. And basically what that meant was the workers who worked in Pullman by day lived in the town. So there you have the factory where the workers worked. Then the town is where they lived. And the company owned the town. And this town, basically, they paid rent to the company they worked for. And there's a lot of reasons why, if you're a company, you like the idea of a company town. And the biggest one is you can control your workers. You have, you know, there's supervision. You can impose curfews. You can, you know, monitor them, all those types of things. What ends up happening is they cut wages, again, 25 to 50%. But they don't cut the cost of rent for the people living in Pullman. So the workers fed up with years of being laid off and wage cuts and poor working conditions form a union and go on strike. And the strike is led by the American Railway Union. The Pullman strike of 1894 takes place. And the head of the American Railway Union is a guy whose name you're going to hear a couple times over the next couple months, a guy by the name of Eugene Debs. He and his union had power. power. And basically, the power came from the fact that the workers were able to paralyze the railroad industry. The, the railroad industry was shut down. Eugene Debs, a fiery speaker, 
Um, in fact, you see him in this political cartoon, they're referring to him as King Debs. And in the backdrop, you have railroad depots just kind of sitting with nothing going on. Now what ends up happening is Pullman tries to hire some strike breakers, scabs. The, the workers resist those strike breakers from coming in. The president at the time, another guy with a horrible name, Grover Cleveland, even says, and he uses the excuse that the mail was not being delivered. If it takes the entire army and navy to deliver a postal card in Chicago, that card will be delivered. And he basically says by the workers going on strike, they're preventing the distribution of the mail, and it's used as a way troops are sent in, the court rules that the workers have to go back to work. Things turn violent. Those workers who were not fired were blacklisted. And the strike is crushed. Federal troops, the courts, blacklisting. And even up until 1900, the union membership remained weak. About 5% of workers belong to unions. But what you see happening is even though these defeats are taking place and workers are facing numerous challenges, they continue to, to put pressure on companies to address the needs and concerns of, of workers. But numerous problems remain. Houston, we have a problem. And so what you're going to see is it's going to take a long, hard fight for this to eventually um, result in victory for unions. But in spite of these challenges, they continue to fight. Um, and make sure you read about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire to really see how bad uh, these, these conditions and these, these uh, realities were for workers. If you have questions... Email me, drj2277 at lausd.net. Peace.